Well, welcome back to Midweek Connect in our study of First John. Uh, Gabe, thanks for giving me the week off last week. I uh, I was on vacation, and so we're uh, was grateful for that time, but grateful to get back into God's Word with you together tonight. So let's take our copies of God's Word and turn to 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to look together at just a few verses tonight, 12 through 14. And though it may not seem at first blush that there's a lot here, there is something for us to grab hold of. Um, my son recently has been, my oldest son has recently been uh, climbing and, and um, has been enjoying that a lot and has spent a lot of his time, recreational time, learning to climb and climb well. And, and you know, I, I, I've just always seen um, rock walls at, you know, arcades and stuff like that and never really thought much about it. But watch the movie um, about Alex Honnold that, uh, when he climbed El Capitan, uh, and uh, did it um, without any rope at all. And um, a movie called Free Solo, and I was amazed at some of the grips that Alex Honnold was able to, to get onto the wall, to be able to pinch little bitty things that you and I would just think of as imperfections in the rock wall or maybe not even notice at all. Alex Honnold was, uh, is, is able to see those as, as a life-saving grip to the edge of the rock. And it is an amazing thing to see. And, and even watching Connor begin to climb and how he is strengthening his hands and beginning to see those things for himself and uh, beginning to, to grip the wall in places that I would not have imagined I would have had a grip. Um, that We have to treat the scripture that way, that when we come to the scripture initially, what we come to it as is maybe like one of those, like me, who doesn't really understand climbing all that well, and I look at a rock wall and I just think, well, it's all kind of the same. Or, I, I, you know, if, it, if there's not a big place for me to put my foot, then I'm obviously not going to be able to climb up. And so it, you, you have to look for obvious things. But the more that you do it, the more you begin to see that every single nuance is something to grab hold of. And this is true in the scripture as well, that the more we verse ourselves in the scripture, the more we spend time in it, the more we love it. The more we study it, the more we see that there are little grips along the way that help us to hold fast to the truth and help us to advance even along areas when we may think that there is not a lot for us or maybe that we'll have to turn back and go the different direction. What God is calling us to do is to see those small grips. This is one of those small grips uh, in this because it's a, it's a section of scripture here in 1 John that many people just move right past because it seems to be repetitive it seems not to say a lot, and it and um, in our uh, cultural ear, it doesn't really do much for us. And so we read it, we you know we we recognize that it's there, but we don't stop to turn you know the diamond to see the um, to see the brilliance of of the gem that's before us. And so, um, you know, I'm not saying this is going to be life changing stuff, uh, but it can be every time we go to the Bible. Every time we come to the Bible, it doesn't matter what we're reading, if we invest ourselves in the study of it, it is, it is applicable to our life and can be life-changing. So we don't want to skip over any of these things. And um, I just want to walk you through this little section of Scripture. We're going to do 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. If you have your pen, a uh, notebook preferably that you're taking notes and, and thinking about the structure of the letter and, and what's happening then um, I encourage you to go ahead and get that out and let's begin to look at this again. But since we were off last week, just a very, very quick overview. John begins the letter, uh, you know, tour de force, epic style, by, by speaking of Jesus, whom he has been with. Then he speaks of the holiness of God and the holiness that, that God has. The, the message of the book, arguably, is that God is light and uh, that, that we must align ourselves with the light that is God the Father, that the light that has been revealed in Jesus Christ the Son and continues to empower us in the Holy Spirit. So all these things are present here in 1 John. But we come into this uh, talking about, first of all, the light that God has, and then tests, little tests along the way, always in 1 John, little tests to show us whether we're in the truth or not in the truth, or in the light or in, not in the light. And this is because, of course, there are... Uh, those in the church and out of John's particular congregation that are now teaching heresy and teaching things like Jesus was not God, um, that he um, that uh, that they don't have any sin in their lives, that they um, that they don't need to do what Jesus tells them to do in order to be saved. So he, he's he's addressing this in a very pastoral way, and he 
he goes through and begins that. He, he talks about what Christ has done for them in the beginning of chapter 2, talking about the sin that's been taken care of through Jesus, the, the propitiation that has been made, and that we have an advocate in the Father, in Jesus Christ, if we do sin, but that we are to also walk in a way that's honoring to uh, what Jesus has done for us, and that that's how we know that we can be saved. And then he gets into this teaching on love, which most people would identify First John as a book on love, that it's about the love of God, it's about the love of brother to brother, and all these things. And so um, we we see that the, the holiness of God and the the, the worthiness of the saints is tied up into this ethic of love, this way that we live our lives that's steeped in and um, always uh, wrapped in love. And so he's, he's giving a pretty theological discourse as we start out. I mean, we, we talk about the beginning of the book and how epic it is, but it really is a theological look at who Jesus is and how he has come into the world and his station from, the, from eternity past. And then we, we talk about all these other things that, that John mentions. They're all very theological in nature. So just like any, any pastor who wants to address his people, most of the time it's good for pastors to stop and say, well, what does the Bible say? What is true? What does, what does theology teach us? Theology, of course, being the study of God. How do we go back then to our source of truth, which is the Word of God? And we'll see that even in 1 John. But we go back to the source of truth to find out what it is that God has said. And, and, it, and how does that relate to who he is? Well, John's doing that. John is giving us a, a wonderful pastoral template here as he, as he teaches his people. And after all of this theological discourse, he wants to grab them personally. He wants to, to get their attention. He wants to appeal to them on a personal level. Um, it's just as if I were telling my kids um, about crossing the street. I might tell them about the street itself. You know, this is a four lane street. So cars are coming from one direction on one side and then going the other direction on the other side. There's a turn lane in the middle in which cars will go into that turn lane and they may stop. They may be going left or right. You have to watch their blinker to see if they're doing that or not. You know, there's a stop, a light at the end of this street at the corner and a crosswalk. And there's a crosswalk that's showing you whether you need to stop or you can go. And I, I may be able to explain all those things to my kids. I may even take them to the street and say, there it is. Take a look at it and see what you see here. And then when I really want to get serious, I may just look at them. I have three boys and I may just say, hey, boys, look at me. I want you to understand something. I love you enough to tell you about this street because I want you to be safe when you're going across it daily. And that is what John is doing here. He's giving us some explanations, but then he's basically taking his hands with the writer's pen. Uh, so metaphorically, he's using this writer's pen to take his hands and cup them around our face and to pull our eyes up to meet his and say, I have something to say to you. So this is his love letter to his family. And uh, let's look at this love letter to his family uh, today. And so um, let's look at, uh, just I'm gonna read these three verses for you, beginning in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. And it says this, this is the word of the Lord, of course. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Well, so this is John's love letter to his family. This is where he really pauses to get their attention. So as we have done in the weeks past, let's just look at the, the structure of this set of verses, and we'll talk a little bit about the implications that they bring to our lives at the end. But if you'll just notice here um, that you have two triads together. Um, one is in verses 12 and 13, uh, and then the other one is at the end of 13 and verse 14. So they Verse 13 kind of splits these things up in an odd way. 
Um, usually you don't see verses sharing uh, like that too often, but here we do have it that way. Um, don't think about the verse delineations as much as you think about the grammatical delineation. So the verse, the verses then that are put in there, sometimes they are wonderful descriptions of how you break up a text. And other times they're not as helpful, that they may not break up the text exactly the way the grammar does. And so this is one of those instances where the, the, numering, the enumerating of verses, which is not something that's inspired, um, that's uh, something that came along later on to help us to understand where things are and to get around in our Bibles quickly. It's a very helpful system, but um, not something that, certainly not something that we would hold to as inspiration. And this is one of those things where the verses just aren't helpful in breaking the text up. And so take a look at the text together, and you'll see that there's, three, there's two triads here where he says, I am writing, and he says that three times, and then he repeats the process. So it's not that he says, I am writing six times and builds all the way through. He says, I am writing three times, and then he switches it, the tense a little bit and then uh, writes, I'm writing again um, in a very a slightly different tense the second time around, but then three more times. So you have in verse 12, beginning, I am writing to you. In verse 13, I am writing to you. And then halfway down in verse 13, I am writing to you. And then the latter part of verse 13, 13 he says, I write to you. And then verse 14, I write to you. And then midway down verse 14, I write to you. So the first section of those that the first triad, I am writing to you. And it's just talking about how he's doing this. And then I write, which is not necessarily a past tense, but it's also not necessarily not a past tense. So um, we're not talking about maybe two different kinds of writing that maybe that's been talked about in uh, among theologians and and commentators uh, over the years, and I don't read it that way. I, I see this as being, I am writing this one thing, uh, that what I am saying to you now, and um, he's just expressing it in a way that gets people's attention. Oftentimes when you say something multiple times, obviously you're doing it for emphasis, and so he is using the, the, the tool of repetition uh, to to really emphasize strongly what he's saying here. And, and again, it's, it's like when you're speaking to someone, I, I used this metaphor before, but um, the, the illustration of putting your hands on someone's face uh, to, to pull their face up for your eyes to meet their eyes. And that that is a very intimate kind of speaking to one another. You very often do not have people touching you in that way. It's certainly not on your face unless you are just in a very intimate a very intimate moment, very intimate relationship. I have done this with my children. I very rarely, very rarely, I'm, as a matter of fact, I don't know that I can think of another instance where I have done this uh, maybe maybe once or twice outside of my own family when I have touched someone's face to speak to them, to to, to really to, to bring them in, to, to hear what I'm about to say to them, and I want it to be to heard um, in a special way. Um, that, that is a that's an incredible invasion of privacy, isn't it? Can you imagine if we just talk to each other all the way and grabbing each other's face? But that's that's really uh, what he's doing here in a literary sense. He's kind of cupping our face in his hands and just, I am writing, I am writing, I am writing. I write to you, I write to you, I write to you. And so um, don't make too much of the, the different tenses here of, of I am writing or I write to you, but do note that uh, that it is a different tense, um, slightly, and uh, that it that it, it could you know it could mean that, that he's talking about two different works. But I just find that so hard to believe because this letter is so focused on um, getting this point across about who God is and what it means to be in Him. And you have to understand too that he's writing um, he's writing intensely in this moment because he cares very much about his own sheep being led astray by false teaching. And you need to keep that always in the back of your mind. That is the backdrop of what John is trying to explain to his people is that he does not want them to fall into false doctrine, to fall into false teaching, because once we do, we let go of all sorts of things. And once we get into that, our our very faith then become, uh, becomes something that is in question, or at least in danger, uh, we we could very well fall away. And we're 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 in a day where it's just not that strange to see people who have served in ministry for many years 
saying, we don't believe this anymore. And we don't, we don't, I've deconstructed my Christian faith and walking away from what they formerly held and walking away from the relationship that they would formerly claim to have with Jesus Christ. And many of them not even believing that Jesus is a historical figure anymore, or if he is a historical figure, that he is in very much so not who he says he was, that he's not the son of God. He's not God himself, certainly. And he never rose from the dead and those sorts of things. Well, that's what false doctrine does to us. Obviously, that is the product of an unbelieving heart. It's the product of a sinful heart. Um, and while we all have um, we all have the safeguard of, of the community around us, the Word of God in our lives, that those are safeguards that we put in our lives to make sure that we don't also walk away or fall away. But if we are in sin, if we're in false teaching, then we have very much more reason to be afraid. And Paul, I mean Paul, John would have been. Uh, deeply concerned that though these false teachers are teaching error and error does not accord with truth and truth, uh, people that are in Christ will not follow another shepherd, right? He is concerned that there is this sense in which the, the devil, like a roaring lion, is prowling, looking for whom he can devour and that he would lead away, if possible, even God's elect. And so we know that the elect are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. But that doesn't stop Satan from trying to, to, to deceive them and pull them from Christ. And so uh, John would have been very concerned for his, for his own flock, so concerned that he would have stopped them in their tracks, cupped their hands in his, or cupped their face in his hands, and said, I want you to listen very closely. I'm writing to you. And so he, he evokes them in three different terms. You see this. And he uses this two times in two ways. Now, there's one of these terms is slightly different. We'll talk about that. But the first two, uh, the first three, uh, uh, the, the first triad of I am writing to you, he, he discusses three different groups. He says, little children, fathers, and young men. And then the second triad, he discusses children, which is a slightly different word than little children. He, he gives it a, a, a more common word. The second time around, like, you know, okay, hey, kids. So um, this is uh, kind of the hey, kids of, uh, of, the, of the one. The reason why it's translated in our English edition, I'm using the ESV, the reason why it's translated little children in the ESV is because it, it gives a sense of, of real intimacy there, that when John uses this particular form of the word child, it's, it's uh, exclusively in the terms of intimacy and, and very familial relationship. So it's uh, it's not just that he thinks of them as immature. It's not that. It's that he's looking at them as his own spiritual children. You remember Paul said of Timothy, my son in the faith. And so if we're the family of God, um, all of us are children of God the Father. But in, in some special ways, we, we often have spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers in our life. And so uh, Tim, uh, John would be looking at the, his, his flock as his little children, as his the ones that he cares about and wants to uh, give his life to. And so he, he uses that very intimate term The first in the first triad. I'm writing to you little children, my little children. And I think that's really precious that he starts that way. In the second triad, he uses a more common word for children, but it's still that, that same idea. I, I, he, he just doesn't repeat it in the sense of like my precious little children, my intimate children, the, the ones that I deeply love. I remember John was the beloved disciple. He's, 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 he is a very versed in what it means to give your life in an affectionate way to another person. And so he loved his Lord that way. He loves his flock that way. And uh, so you see him uh, starting out both triads with the term children to show, I'm speaking to all of you that are my precious ones. And that's where he gets the term little children, both in verse 12 and verse 13. The second term he uses is fathers. He says fathers, and so he says, I write to you fathers, and he does that twice in each triad. It's my little children, my precious children, and then my children, and then fathers both times. And then fathers is really the idea of those that lead, those that have a federal headship, um, that represent the people. You remember this is a, this is a patriarchal society, in which uh, they, their families are defined by the men that lead these families. And so uh, he's addressing then, uh, you know, it could be that he's addressing like church leaders, 
but but probably not. He's probably simply addressing the fact that he's speaking to the body in general, but that that he's addressing the heads of these households, the head of the heads of and leaders of this church of this group of people. That when he says fathers, what he means is. Uh, I'm addressing I'm addressing you in a familial type sense that this has been the confession this has been that you are the people of God and he's really bringing that that into view people that in this in this first century that as they read this would have understood John's intent when he wrote the word fathers to mean that he's speaking of those that kind of heads of household federal heads um, representative of the entire people and so, as the fathers go, so go the people. And that is the idea there. Then the third term that he uses is young men. And it is specifically young men. Now we'll talk about an application of that in a moment. But the, but the, but the actual verbiage, which is different than an application. So some of you may have a Bible that, um, that, that says young people. Uh, I disagree with that kind of uh, translation work, uh, not totally. I mean, there's value in it, but what it's doing is taking the it's it's a it's a dynamic equivalent kind of a translation where you're using words that that would translate into how we understand them more than just the literal translation of the text. And so, a lot of times you'll see it used in that sort of uh, gender neutral type of thing where you take a a word that is uh, specifically gender oriented and you make it uh, neutral or you would say where it says men it would say people or where it says women it would say church or you know just you know that sort of thing where you're just kind of making it about everybody and that may be the application of the text it really might and and we'll talk about that in here in a moment but but the but the word itself is young men. And so that's the why it's translated this way. So young men then has the connotation of young, vibrant, life-filled uh, doers. These, uh, you know, think about the wars that are fought. Who fights those wars? Young men do. I mean, when you look at, uh, at old footage of, of the, the soldiers storming the sea, uh, storming the beach at Normandy, as they come in to, uh, on, on D-Day to, to push back the German forces and they take those beaches on D-Day, who is it that's coming off of those boats? It is young men. Who's para, who's, uh, who are the paratroopers coming out of those planes? They're young men. And when you see, uh, oftentimes when you see great offenses uh, that are, uh, you know, great works that are done, you're, you're doing them on the backs of strong, young men. That this is a... a this is talking about the vibrancy of youth. Um, that they're not they're not fathers. They don't have the appeal of of representing the entirety. They don't have the appeal of age and wisdom. But they are young, vibrant men. They're the the ones that are in the mix, and they they have all their whole life ahead of them. And so, it's very uh, much that he's addressing the the ones that are established that that have families. That are the older people. And these younger people, the ones that are in the mix now and kind of the doers now. And that's why he addresses young men. Now, I'll save my application for that for just a moment. Let me just go through and just talk about the next, uh, his theological implications for these, uh, for these triads. And I'll try to do these quickly. Um, I'm trying to keep these, uh, these lessons to uh, a little bit shorter so that you can digest them in, in a, a shorter time. But uh, he says um, at the beginning in verse 12, I'm writing to you little children because, and so we have because, 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 and then another three because. This is why he's writing to us. Well, he says to the little children, to everyone that's there, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Remember that this is about a redeemed people first and foremost. This is the people of God. This is Christ's people. And if we don't remember that we're, our sins are forgiven, well, then we've lost it all because we are those that needed a great Savior. We, our sins are forgiven, not for our own sake, but for His name's sake. And we remember back in like Ezekiel and we look at um, chapter 37, maybe, when we, when we talk about um, how uh, the, the name of God has been profaned in the nations and He's going to claim the glory of his name back by using them and giving them new hearts. And 
You know, our sin is great. Boy, our sin is great. He reminds us at this very beginning, hey, my precious little children, you're sinners, but you've been forgiven of your sin. If we don't have a huge and deep and big theology of our sin, we will never know the depth of our forgiveness of that sin. And so it is important for us to know that God has forgiven us his uh, forgiven us of our sin. And that is a tremendous truth. It is a Mount Everest that if we, if we don't understand that we've been forgiven sin uh, and how great that forgiveness is, we begin to lose a luster of what it is even to be in Christ at all. We begin to lose a luster of what it means for God to be holy. And when that happens, we begin to to form different theologies that give us the right to believe certain things about ourselves that may not be true. And so it's important for us to remember at the very beginning as he cups his hands around our face and pulls us close and whispers to us how important this is, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. His name's sake is obviously Jesus, that, uh, that he's looking at the work of Christ here. He's calling us back to look at the beauty of, of this Jesus whom he loved and whom he, he saw and touched and heard and handled with his own hands. This was the, the, the Savior that loved him so well and that he loved so well. He's pointing us back to that. So little children, remember that your sins are forgiven. And then to you fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And again, him who is from the beginning, who is that? Well, in the very beginning of this letter, it was Jesus, that we're looking at Jesus Christ, him who was from the beginning. Now, who else is from the beginning? It's God the Father, it's God the Spirit, of course. We don't wanna, we don't wanna just single out Christ here, but John is gonna do some pretty, uh, pretty sweet things here through this little section where he calls attention to a, a certain member of the Trinity, and here he's, he's calling attention to Jesus. You've known him who's from the beginning. And, you know, as we come to this sort of knowledge of God, when we first come to Christ, it may be that we're so enamored with him because we can't believe what it is that he's done for us, that it's really more centered around, I can't believe I'm forgiven. I can't believe that I am beloved of the Father. I have been such a great sinner, and now he has cleaned me, and he's made me his, and I am, uh, he is mine, and I am his. And you, you think about terms of what he's done for me, and the more that you walk with him, what delights you is certainly that. And I would argue it only gets deeper as you get to know him. But what happens is that you begin to stop looking so much at your own experience and you begin to look at who he is and you begin to know who God is and you begin to cherish not what he has done necessarily, but who he is. And boy, the, the benefits of God are amazing, but they flow from the very character and nature of God. And so we think about this as a, as a mature faith. That's what Ephesians says we're going to, that we're, we have pastors given to us to equip the saints for the work of ministry until we all attain to the maturity of the faith. And that's why we want to see this sort of thing. You've known him who is from the beginning. We, we want to see a, a, an eternal God in our view. We don't ever want to have a small view of God. And these fathers, the ones that represent the, the fullness of the people, they know him from the beginning. And then he says he's writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. What an amazing thing. Who overcame the evil one? Was it you? Was it me? Well, in a sense, yes, that we have victory over Satan. We have victory over the one that would have if he had had his way, would have toppled God off of his very throne in heaven. And this is something that we can always take great joy in, that he has been defeated utterly, that his head has been crushed. And that is the promise of Genesis 3, that that she that this, this serpent will strike the offspring's heel and the, that, that offspring will crush the head of the serpent. And, and it certainly says that Christ has overcome there is a, there's a theological view of Christ. It's Christus Victor, the Victor Christ, the victorious Christ that comes in to rule over his enemies and to put everything under his feet. And that is certainly a very biblical picture of the risen Jesus, that he comes with a sword in his hand when he returns. He comes uh, wielding great power that no one can stand before him. It, it even is that he does not enter into battle. He simply speaks, and by the word of his mouth, his enemies fall. This is who Jesus is, and he has overcome the enemy, and guess what? We're in him. 
John has already talked about our union with Christ in the letter, and he says, you have overcome the evil one, and how he appeals to the, to the young men's vigor and strength and, and just their drive, doesn't he? You've overcome. You have won. You have uh, put your feet on the head of Satan. Uh, a, a, a close friend of mine who is just, well, he's a better friend to me than I am to him, but he he often calls me to check on me and to just to catch up with me and share what's going on with he and his church. But he shared a picture on social media the other day of a, of one of their church musicians who had created a rug uh, to to stand on and to put his uh, music stand and uh, and his equipment on this rug, as, as sometimes musicians do. And the rug is a, is is a serpent. It's an asp of some kind with its mouth open, its teeth bared, ready to strike. And uh, he, 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 he put this down to worship on. And the reason he says he put it down to worship on was because I want to trample the head of the serpent every time that I sing God's praises. In, uh, in Brian's post, he says, we ain't playing around. I love that. I think that's just beautiful imagery that we stand on the head of Satan. We are those that have overcome. Well, that's the first triad. He does it again, children, fathers, young men. And he gives basically... Uh, similar theological exhortations here. Why am I doing this? Why am I writing these words? Well, here's the reasons once more. Listen to me as I speak to you, my beloved ones. He's still got our, his hands on our face and he's still talking to us intimately. I write to you children because you know the Father. Well, before it was because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. And what's the reality of that? The reality is if our sins are forgiven, then we enter into a knowledge of the Father. And this is really more uh, telling of God the Father instead of Jesus Christ. We, we start out with Jesus and his atoning work for us. And we then come to this the, because you know the Father. And so he's, he's really impressing upon them the, the triune nature of God here and how that they come to know the fullness of who he is. My little children, you know, uh, the ones that I care for, you know the Father. That, that intimacy has, has also been birthed in you, not just with Jesus the Son, who, who these false teachers are mischaracterizing, but because of that God the Father. This goes way beyond who Jesus is. This is about the fullness of the triune God. He says, I write to you, Father, because you know him who is from the beginning. Again, he's saying the exact same words, but with a different sort of emphasis, right? Before it was the emphasis on Jesus, and now it's the emphasis on God the Father. And um, this has been one of the reasons why people think maybe John was talking about two different works here. I, I just don't see it that way. I really just see this as, an, uh, as a restatement with a slight nuance that just gets them to think even deeper about who they are as these fathers. And as we represent the people, as we are the federal heads of our homes and the leaders in the church, um, then we know, we know this is that Jesus is in us and that we are the fathers. And so he, we, because you know him who is from the beginning, this knowledge too is kind of flying in the face of what these early Gnostic um, heretics are saying that this um, uh, Gnosticism is kind of in its infancy here. It's not fully developed, but it was that idea that they could be holy on the inside without being holy on the outside. And Jesus had a lot to say about that, right? And um, so that if you're not holy on the outside, you can't be holy on the inside. And even if you are holy on the outside, it may be that you're you know, a tomb on the inside. You're just whitewashed. And so um, this idea of, of being duality, a duality in our spirit and, and flesh is something that, that John rejects and says is outside the pale of Christian doctrine. And so even as he's talking about knowing him from the beginning, this knowledge of God is really central to what it means to then live these things out and to bring them into the flesh and into the, the natural world because all those things matter. Uh, and then he says, I write to you young men because, and he elaborates on what it means to overcome the evil one. And he appeals to their own sense of strength. And look what he says, because you are strong. And he talks about their strength, their vitality. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm still a young man at 41 years of age. But uh, the, the older I get, the, the more that years pass on, the more that I can see that it's going to take more work for me to stay vibrant, to stay energetic. Um, we, we've got friends of ours at our house this week, um, just blessing them by keeping their children so they can get some respite. 
and um, we're, we're keeping their five kids and um, they're keeping each other up at night <laughs> and they were waking each other up all night last night. And um, one of our kids was just worn out today and I rubbed him on the back this morning. I was like, well, now you know how it feels to be a parent. <laughs> you go to bed, you think you're going to sleep all night long. No way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as we get older, those kind of things wear on us more where I could spend all night up organizing or studying as I would sometimes do even as a young child. Um, I, I still have that tendency to want to stay up all night long and do something, but uh, I find that much harder at 41 than I did at 27. Uh, you know, as I try to get healthy, that's much harder at 41 than it was at 27. So I get it that we, we begin to slow down. And as young men, you just have this strength and vitality. He says that this strength doesn't come from nowhere. What does he say? And the word of God abides in you. The word of God abides in you. Why are we strong? How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to his word. How do we stay sinless? By living according to the word. How do we, how do we find power in our lives? By living according to the word. It's the centrality of the word in our lives that makes us strong. Never forget that. It is imperative to your life as a Christian that you be strong in the faith. And that as you do that, you must come to God's word. The word of God abides in you. And again, that play on words that, uh, that John is always using here uh, is kind of that he, the word and Christ are kind of one. He's been talking about the father here, but you can see how he's constantly shifting the, the diamond of God's glory and letting us see the great things that God's doing. So he's, he's showing that the word of God abides in in you, that this, this living incarnate word is in us through his spirit. And uh, he says, because of that, and you have overcome the evil one. Well, if we want to see victory in our own lives, if we want to see victory in the world around us, if we want to really speak with the power of God, how do we do that? We speak with the word of God. I mean, Christian, never get away from your Bible. Never stop studying your Bible. Never develop a, a coldness toward the Scripture. When that happens, you will fall away. You will. There is no way. When you begin to see the Scripture as just another historic document that has no power from a living God, you will begin to doubt it. You will begin to, to see the seams coming undone. And ultimately, there's no confidence that you can remain in faith if that happens. So trust the Word of God, love the Word of God, seek the Word of God, develop a, a strong passion for the Word of God, and stay in the Word of God. Well, that is how this, uh, how this section of Scripture is, is broken out, these two triads. I'm writing, and I write to you, and then these three different groups, fathers, or children, fathers, young men, and that's in, that's in uh, two sections. And then because of the forgiveness of our sins for His name's sake, We've known him from the beginning, and then we've overcome the evil one. And then again, because we know the Father, that we know him from the beginning, and that we are strong, the word of God's in us, and that because of that, we overcome the evil one. So what are some just basic applications we can make here? Well, first of all, when we see words like fathers and young men, there's two things that I want you to know. First of all, men, don't use this as a hermeneutic to then say that this is for men only. This is the kind of stuff that John would be writing to us men. You ladies got to find something different. It's not what's in view here. This is not something that men use to say this is how men are supposed to be or this is what men are supposed to know and something different is for the ladies. That's just not the way that the first century writers would have understood it or readers would have understood it. It's not the way that John intends it to be written. So the application here when it says fathers really can mean the people. And when it says young men really can mean all of the church. And that's the application. It's not what the text says. And there's a difference there. But the application of that is that this is spoken to the church at large. So ladies, when you come to this, don't come to this with a, with a frown on your face saying, oh, I can't believe the patriarchy of this. Oh, I can't believe that this would be written to men. And why aren't we addressed as women? Why aren't we dignified to be addressed here? And that is not at what is at view here. Take a historical uh, approach to this text and understand that as John is writing here, you are a part of the little children. You are part of the fathers and the young men that are here, that he's addressing the church. 
and that you are in view, you are cherished and loved, that the language of this can't be tripping you up because it doesn't accord with what you feel is right in this day and age. And so men do not hold it over women. That is not your place to do that. It's not what's intended to do. Women do not be offended at this, but see yourselves as an integral part of it and just uh, just understand that John is taking all of us by the face, all of us and lifting our heads into the knowledge of this. Also understand too that it's written to every age group that all of us then find ourselves in this text. If you're old, if your hands are weak, if they're full of arthritis, if you're in a wheelchair and, you're, and disease is beginning to overtake your body and you don't have the stamina that you used to have, do not think that you are useless to the church. Fathers, you know him who is from the beginning. Well, that is a great encouragement to those who are older, isn't it? That we, that though we may feel our age, we are very young when it comes to the view of eternity. If we've lived 70, 80, 90, even 110 years, we are still very young when it comes to the ancient of days. We are a blip on the eternal radar with that kind of lifespan. So we are, we are just at the beginning of the infancy of knowing the fullness of who he is. We've known him from the beginning, and we know what the implied uh, language is here is that we will know him till the end, that we'll know him until eternity past. I mean, we'll know him to an eternity future, not just from eternity past. So um, you have something to give to the church. Never sit on that. Never come to the Bible with an attitude that I don't need to learn this. Don't ever look at a book of the scripture and say, oh, this is past where, or this was before when I needed it, when I was younger, when I was when I had a family at home, never treat the Bible that way. The, the text on children, the text on marriage, the text on sex, the text on giving, the text on money, the text on jobs, all of those things are applicable to you if you sit in a wheelchair in a nursing home. That this is for you. This is for us that we always should read because you are not alone. You are connected to the body of Christ and it's for you. For, these, for those of you that are young, don't think, well, I'm just going to wait and I'm going to sow my wild oats or I'm going to do what I can do now and I'll get serious about my faith later on. That never happens that way. You need to get serious about your faith now. You need to know that this is what God is calling you to now and live in it now. That's the only way that we can, uh, that we can know that we are in him is by giving ourselves to it now. The strength that you have in your youth, do not waste it on your own passions pour it out for the cause of the gospel. Work at being holy. Work at being a, a, a person of light that trusts in and, and lives in the light of the gospel. And then uh, for, uh, for all of us, understand that we live in this, uh, the, the reality that we are little children of the Father. And, and when someone like a John comes along, and I'm a pastor of a church, uh, albeit a young pastor to many in our congregation, when we come as pastors, know that we come with this sort of fatherly uh, intention in our hearts toward you. It doesn't matter if you're 15 or if you are 81. When we look at you, we look at you as the sheep of Jesus Christ to which we then have been given oversight and that we want to love you well, that we want to care for you, that we want to turn your eyes away from that which would draw you away from Christ. We want to give ourselves to you in such a way that you can not only learn from us, but follow our examples. And so pray for us as we do those things. But, but we love you so intensely and that, that we come, all of us, as little children. You know, one, of the, one another commands is that we, that we submit to one another in love. And we can only do that as if we have in part the heart of a child. That is why I think Jesus describes little children as being the ones that can enter into the kingdom because they are trusting and they give themselves and they, they bring themselves to submit underneath the authority of those that they see over them. And we all ought to have that sort of heart. If we will, if we'll allow someone to come along and cup their hands onto our face and pull up our eyes, from the, from the mess of the world and look at us with carefulness and love and say, we, because I love you, I want you to understand these things. 
If we will understand the theological truth that Jesus has died for us and forgiven us of our sin, that he has made himself known to us, that we see God in eternity past and on to eternity future, and to know that we that we participate in the triumph of Christ over the evil one, that we have even been the ones that crushed the serpent's head, that gives us great confidence and it gives us great resolve and it lets us know that we're loved, which is what we'll need because John is about to give us the first command in the book. There's only 10 and next week we hear our first imperative. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you. God bless you and I'll see you next week.